And welcome back to No Name Podcast, everyone. Uh, this is Ukrainian podcast on cybersecurity, um, our international series where we talk to cybersecurity experts all over the world to discuss cyber domain of the war, make new connections for Ukrainian infosec community, and uh, learn from our colleagues abroad. Today we speak with uh, Max Smith, a senior researcher at the, the Center of Security Studies, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and director of European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. Max, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a really wonderful initiative, so I'm glad to be on this podcast. Absolutely. And so uh, during uh, during the last couple of years, right, you authored, uh, co-authored, co-edited uh, several awesome books. Um, and so uh, what's your secret to keeping, you know, such high level of productivity, uh, especially considering that the lockdown was uh, lifted and we didn't have so much time uh, times on our hands as we did in like 2020? Uh, I'm glad you perceived it that way. Well, to be very honest, much of the productivity or output of last year, um, like all that stuff, I wrote during the lockdown. So I'm not sure if I can keep it up, but it's <laughs> oh, okay. really still a question on whether I can publish uh, the coming years. Um, a bit cliche, but I guess I, I do really, really enjoy the subject, really enjoy doing research in the field, and I kind of let my interest guide uh, whatever I'm working on at a at a given point in time, and I think that's the if there is a secret, then uh, then that's it. I really wake up every morning and uh, and enjoy the work that I'm doing. Awesome. Um, so then let's uh, discuss some of uh, some of your works. Uh, uh, you know that might be interesting to our Ukrainian listeners uh, listeners through uh, the lens of questions. You know of Ukrainian uh, uh, situation right now and the war with Russia. Um, in no shortcuts, uh, in your um, uh, book, no shortcuts. Why states struggle to develop military cyber force? Um, you say that uh, the states struggle to develop military cyber force, uh, and we're assuming that the book uh, was uh, started during the peaceful time, uh, as you already uh, kind of said that you wrote it during COVID, uh, probably the most peaceful time uh, of recent years. Everyone was just sitting at home. Um, so, do you think that such large-scale war? Um, um, as a you know, Russian invasion to Ukraine, which clearly affects the whole uh, the whole world, might may change it, or uh, or the countries will keep struggling, you know, with this cyber force, essentially whatever it is. Yeah, it's it's good to take a few steps back here in terms of the underlying observations of of this book, and it's really twofold. On the one hand, what we have seen over the past uh, certainly one and a half decade is what you can say it's an institutionalization of military cyber efforts. So a growing number of countries have established a military cyber command or something equivalent um, that is then firmly located within the military forces and that received a mandate to potentially conduct cyber effect operations, right? So cyber effect operations here are those operations that seek to disrupt, deny, degrade, and or destroy. Now, whilst we have seen this institutionalization taking place, at the same time, there are actually very few countries that have conducted cyber effect operations or known to have conducted cyber effect operations. And when you look at existing explanations, the majority of research has really focused on the strategic value of um, the cyber uh, effect ops, right? Many will say, well, it's a lousy tool for coercion because you can't really signal with it um, or... Um, you know, the, the others would have argued, well, there are actually norms against the use of cyber uh, effect operations. Some will argue um, it's actually not so much about effect operations, but it's more about espionage. So there is a set of explanations that people have given to argue why they have not occurred. But actually, my argument in this book is, well, Whilst we have seen the institutionalization, people have also had this tendency that it's very sim simple to conduct these activities, and it's actually not the case. And I kind of unpacked that, and there are a number of things here. The first point that I'm making is that there are different operational activities that states can conduct. One type of activity is that, I guess, you can have a state who doesn't care about when it's achieving an effect, against which target is achieving an effect, if it has a strategic potential, and if it uh, influences uh, its intelligence capabilities and so on. Now, those type of operational activities are relatively easy to do. 
But the majority, the great majority of states, particularly the responsible powers, if you look at any country that is part of NATO, they want to do rather specific effect operations, which ensure that there is limited collateral damage, that they take place at a given point in time, that um, it fits within an international legal framework, that they have strategic potential, of course, that there is interagency coordination and collaboration with some of the intelligence services. And those type of operational activities, the resources and time required to conduct them are way, way higher. And so that's kind of one that I'm kind of an unpacking. The second thing, and I think that goes more to the heart of your question, is to look at the missions of these, uh, of these cyber commands today. And when we think about how they are established, ultimately the most important assets of these cyber commands are the people that work there, not your te- just your technical people, but a much broader set of people. But if you look at the missions of these cyber commands, they don't really have a peacetime mission. Because that's for the intelligence service. They're not allowed to go out there and conduct these effect operations in peacetime. No, they require often a parliamentary approval that they can only get in wartime. And in a wartime, they can, you know, not even always do the reconnaissance part because that's then part of the intelligence service. But they can only then, you know, deliver that um, that payload that uh, seeks to disrupt, deny, degrade, and or destroy. Now, what does that mean from a people's perspective? Well, How do you train then your talent? How do you retain then your talent? How do you recruit your talent? All of those questions then become a lot harder because your peacetime mission um, is so limited. And so when you look at the war in Ukraine today, well, to some degree, it hasn't changed that much because, of course, when you look at the great majority of cyber commands that are established, they now haven't received some type of parliamentary approval that um, let's say the Dutch or the Danes or, or Germany can now go out and uh, whatever, hack Russian uh, critical infrastructure and conduct some effect operations. So in many ways, that problem that many of them face of a sort of kind of uh, being handicapped um, is, is still uh, persists today. And that ultimately leads to a whole range of, of other questions that I'm happy to delve into. And so um, the, they can do uh, some defes- defensive capabilities during, you know, during peacetime? Or? It, it depends. So many of the cyber commands are set up with a specific mission. They are kind of war fighting units. Mm. And, and so pe- the defensive operations are then often in the hands of uh, a range of other institutions that could either be you know, your, your typical intelligence activity that is more generally in the hands of the intelligence agencies, and it depends from country to country, or yeah, the real defensive activity might even be in the hands of, um, uh, you know, depends on the country. In, in, in some cases, it would be fall under the Ministry of Justice and not under the Ministry of Defense, or it could be even a police mission for some, or it could be a entirely different department, like I guess in the US, you will have a, a, a DHS or so um, when it comes into defense, they are then in a difficult situation because they are not allowed to do the more active reconnaissance that is then in the hands of, uh, yeah, the intelligence. They are not allowed to operate often domestically, right? Because you don't want to have militaries being active in domestic networks. So there is a bit of a conundrum there um, than what they are allowed to do at that given point in time. And that means that they are not often not even allowed to um, do what we call OPE, operational preparation of the environment, where they potentially do get access to networks to, in the future, deliver these effects. So, in a way, it's um, organizational limitation. It's a massive organizational limitation that you see. It's many of the cyber forces are structured around conventional forces, but the cyber domain logic. Um, is not entirely the same as the conventional logic. For operational activity, you often need a long time to prepare, which means that you often need to have access long before a war occurs, and you need to maintain that access. You need to continuously update it. And when you think, again, about the most critical asset, you know, your people, you know, like, I guess if you, in, in peacetime for conventional forces, if you develop some military capability, if you uh, build it up, you know, your missiles don't get bored and leave. But your people, 
They do, right? And so especially when you have a private sector that wants to draw many of them in, it's then becoming a much harder kind of sell um, to make sure that they stay within your organization. Um, I think it's actually the right time maybe to jump into question like and to focus uh, basically on Ukraine in this case, right? Because Ukraine is actually at wartime. And I know, you know, and it's already like more than one year. And we know that many uh, allies, many, you know, Western countries like support actually Ukraine in cyber force, right? So do you see that this actually serves as a catalyst and we can, you know, uh, bypass these, uh, you know, struggles and we can find some some shortcuts ways to, you know, set up cyber force in one year? Or yeah, I, it's think, still <laughs> I think absolutely. In some ways, of course, it's a it's an awareness, right? Like no shortcuts, no this... shortcuts. <laughs> Vlad jumping Hi, in everyone. here. Ah, sorry, hey, sorry, Vlad. I won't be enabling my video. I, I'm really sorry, but yeah, I have a very poor connection. <laughs> That's all good. Okay. That's all good. Um, no shortcuts, but still, yeah, is it uh, speeding up? <laughs> um, now, to your question, like in some ways, it shows the problems, right? Like in that to have been effective from suddenly February 2022, Ukraine should have thought about some deeper about its military force structure already many years ago, right? And so in some ways, uh, it, it highlights the problem that they they have been facing. On the other hand, as you say, it is a bit of an eye-opener to now really ensure that they are developing a force. And whereas, you know, maybe other countries in peacetime have difficulties to recruit and retrain, retain and train, of course, as they are establishing it uh, in Ukraine, those three issues are... Um, are, are east in a sense that there is a clear mission, there is a clear goal for recruitment, and you know the training is essentially the one of uh, learning as you are doing. So they are in a completely different situation. Now that said, it does of course come still with a host of issues as to what that cyber force then is actually capable of doing. And of course, there are then also other elements. It's not just about the people. There are a range of other elements that are discussed in the book that are essential to be an effective cyber force. Um, so to, to delve into that, like the book provides this topology. I call it the PATIO framework. Uh, PATIO stands for People, Exploits, Tools, Infrastructure, and Organization. And many others will have thought of, talk about when you're developing capabilities is about, you know, develop uh, like acquiring your, your exploits, setting up your, or making sure you have the right tools, your implants, but actually, it's that infrastructure part that is the most expensive and the hardest to do. And that's a big challenge for Ukraine if they are now, you know, really want to set up a military cyber force to then get the right infrastructure in place to conduct these operational activities. And with infrastructure, that means a range of things. On the one hand, it includes even your databases, your targeting databases. What can you actually go after? We know from, you know, uh, some of the leaks that in the U.S. and some of the most mature uh, cyber organizations, these targeting databases are really, really extensive, whether this is collecting information from really almost any personal computer to creating more specific databases around, you know, who are all the system administrators in a given region of the world. Um, you know, that that is one. And the second is, you know, creating a training environment and testing environment that is often very costly too. We know, for instance, the U.S. Army has recently um, um, put out an acquisition or actually last year already of a uh, billion dollar cyber range. Now, Ukraine certainly do doesn't have need to have a cyber range of that extent, but it does need to create the right testing environment to ensure that when it's conducting these operations, they are not causing too much collateral damage. They are, they are actually doing what they want to be doing and so that is going to be a, you know, that will be a huge task to achieve in such a short period of time, um, considering all the other priorities that exist today. So in terms of like in the patio framework, right? So still, uh, do you consider like people are, are, are the most like important uh, uh, asset here or? People are unquestionably the most important asset, yes. And, and with that, I mean a wide range of different people. You know, some people talk about, oh, the hackers that work at a cyber command and don't really further unpack what that entails. But when we talk about people, we talk about 
first your your operators and your developers and your system administrators, perhaps a bit of front office that are your more your technical folks that in the larger commands will be increasingly specialized. Um, although there are benefits to similar to, as, as you will know better than I do, being in the Bay Area, you know, there are similar incentives for DevOps uh, to make sure that the operational teams and development teams work closely together. But then you've got a whole host of other people. You can think about your analysts, you can think about your strategists, your legal experts, and um, making sure that those are well coordinated and, and work well together is, 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 is not an easy challenge. Making sure that your legal people truly understand the requirements to conduct soft, certain operations, are able to monitor operations throughout their operational stages, and at the same time, having your operators being able to explain this in easy enough language for more senior people to understand, that is often a skill that can only be really developed over a longer period of time. Um, so, you know, the people are unquestionably the most critical of your force, and then the, the, the your, your exploits um, you know, are, are certainly um, secondary, although it is, as I mentioned, something that people have so often focused on. There are so many books written on how countries and the, the better ones are, you know, um, running on this engine of, of zero days, uh, unknown, um, like exploits or unknown vulnerabilities. Um, but the reality is slightly different, that even many of the, the better, mature, more mature organizations, actually, the focus is on understanding the target environment of your adversary better than they do themselves. And with that, you often can, can get access in ways that doesn't require something as exotic as an old day, particularly in, in wartime when the operational speed and tempo is, is a lot more significant. Um, so, yeah, so and then so the Patriot and the exploits, the tools impl implants, this is your, 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 your toolbox um, that, again, has questions around how customized do you want to go? My argument would be for Ukraine is that as you know, as the operational tempo increases in more time, you actually want to rely way more on open source tooling, way more on less customized tooling than you would do in peacetime. Um, something actually that you very much see on the Russian side uh, today, where you see them churning out these wipers that are much smaller in size than what you would see before the war but that are kind of being um, quickly used and basically moved on to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. And then your infrastructure, this is where the real costs are. It's the least sexy thing. It's the thing that people talk about the least, um, but um, where really, um, yeah, the big costs uh, lie in some of the bigger countries. We're not talking about the millions anymore that you invest, but the billions. <clears throat> and then the last these organization. Organization here, are really two dilemmas. The first dilemma is how does your military work with the intelligence? To what degree are they able to share um, not just information, but also even share code bases of some of your operational uh, operations? And second, it's the, uh, the big organizational question is how you ensure that on the one hand, you uh, uh, allow your operators to have enough freedom to create this human creativity, to basically find and deceive uh, your adversary in ways that you know are important at that given moment, uh, allow for that creativity, whilst on the other hand, make sure that these operators actually function within a larger organization, that they are not doing things that might you know um, not be um, in accordance to international law or domestic law, and you know make sure that they also follow certain routines that fit the operational patterns of a military organization. Wow, thanks. Uh, thanks for unpacking that. Uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. And so there are many, also many initiatives and like task forces, discussions in Ukrainian community about establishing cyber army units uh, and uh, offensive cyber forces in Ukraine right now. Um, even Ukraine's largest um, uh, charitable uh, organization, Come Back Alive, um, uh, organized a fundraiser to support the country's um, offensive against uh, Russia, though we should call it cyber counter offensive. Um, 
and so we know by now that there are no shortcuts but ukraine also used you know uh used to impress the world in the past year or so um do you think um what do you think would be the most critical for ukraine to invest in uh, in cyber right now and you know how to maybe if not do the shortcut uh, still find the, the the shortest path yeah i mean clearly it's getting the right like to go back, clearly it's getting the right people on board. And there is a huge benefit there for Ukraine to do that. People feel that there is a mission need. And so that's where the benefit is. The second, as I kind of echoing my earlier point, the most challenging one is on the infrastructure side. That's where the biggest costs lie, the hardest to do in a short-term basis. But despite these kind of requirements questions, there is a strategic question here, right? Like, what is it going to do? And that's they are faced with a dilemma in that when you normally think about operating in wartime, you're thinking of operating in two different ways, conducting two different types of effect operations. The first one are what we call counter value operations. So this is when your forces go after national assets of another country. Um, so this would be in the case of an effect operation, Ukraine, Ukraine stri striking deep into Russian territory and let's say take down the power grid in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg with the idea that this raises the cost sufficiently for Russia to potentially reconsider some of his options that it has within Ukraine because it feels a degree of vulnerability or it, it, it has raised the cost of its, uh, its full-scale invasion. The second type of um, operations is what we call counter force operations. Those are operations that are directed against the military forces or logistical structures of your opponents. So in this case, this would be against Russian, uh, you know, let's say supply lines. It could be railway infrastructure. It could also be directly their artillery forces, depending on, uh, on what's available. Now, both of them are limited, right? The first one, you're putting yourself in a pretty dangerous position, particularly against the international public and how this would be perceived if you would go out and conduct these counter value operations against some of the most critical assets in Russia, even if you're able to do so. It would, uh, it may shift public support. It may, it may also lead to even certain consequences that you're unaware of. So it's really tricky um, to do that. Although easier to pull off because the attack surface is so significant, right? Like you can literally, you don't even, you don't need to be very precise on what you want to target as long as it's sort of critical. And that can then be in Moscow, it can be in St. Petersburg, but it can be, fr quite frankly, in any other real city in Russia um, that, you de that, that is deemed worthy enough and, and, and of value enough to do so. So, you know, the attack surface is massive. The opportunities are great you will definitely not need anything fancy to do it, right? You don't need your fancy old days. You just need a dedicated force that is, uh, is going out there to do something like that. But again, the limits there are, are, are one of, largely one of perception. Now, on the counter force side, that's where the attack surface is really small, right? Like almost a, a, a downside of a, of a Russian force that is not as modernized as perhaps some had perceived it uh, a couple of years ago, is that, you know, when it comes to actually operating against it, it's hard to know, well, what can we, you know, how can we really use us effect operations at a given point in time? Um, and, and the timing here is much more important because you do want to do this at a time that is specifically desired and, and needed. And you know, the attack surface there, if it exists at all, it often quickly changes. And so there is this kind of question here for Ukraine around, Okay, if it come, if, if the counter value is is an option that is slightly put off the table, particularly from an international public perspective, the counter force option is is more operationally limited. Then what is this force exactly going to do? And you know, DDoSing some websites that are sort of in between is not really going to have a major operational consequence on the ground, as we can see from from IT Army. Alex, do you want to do exactly. something about information security? Oh, sorry, information operations. Uh, yeah, well, let, let's go there, right? So one, one question, I guess, to also kind of clarify this perpetual uh, framework, uh, do you also consider, in addition to zero days exploits, do you consider information operations, right? If, you know, during the war, we already see, you know, deep fakes, uh, you know, different PSYOP operations. 
Uh, previously, there was this famous internet research agency of trolls, uh, right, uh, from Russia, right? So are those included in these no shortcuts? Uh, so in, in my specific book, no. So I've been looking at, like, what are the requirements to conduct effect operations and not what are the requirements to do information operations. That said, I do think, and, and actually I received a couple of questions of, like, students that are writing, you know, master thesis and one was a PhD. It's like, a similar question, like this Patio framework, does it apply to InfoOps? And I'm like, well, the elements still, you know, you can use them. You can still think through what are the type of people that are required to do InfoOps. Perhaps less, you know, are exploits required, but, uh, you know, you, you still need your tooling, you still need your infrastructure, you still need your organization. So, you know, uh, given that you don't need as much unauthorized access to systems, uh, other than if you're doing cyber-enabled information operations, Mm -hmm. perhaps the exploit part falls away, um, but you will still have to think about these other elements. Now, more broadly about InfoOps and their effectiveness, you know, it is an almost natural one to move to considering what I previously mentioned, considering conundrum that exists on effect operations. To no surprise, uh, Ukraine is focusing and should be focusing on the information operations space because that's where there are gains to be made. Of course, you run into all sorts of questions on uh, its effectiveness and how you're going to measure that. Uh, and that comes on both sides, right? We see a lot of questions in particular about how effective are Russian operations in Ukraine or against Ukraine, or uh, more broadly against, uh, I guess, the Western public. Um, and and uh, it's, a, it's a hard one to answer. To, to, to pick out one, though, which uh, there was this research that has come out uh, now maybe one or two weeks ago um, of a colleague of mine, Leonard Marshmeyer, and, and some of his colleagues, or some, some uh, other people uh, he did this research with. Um, it's a paper called Donesk, Don't Tell, which I think is a terrific title. <laughs> and, and what that research shows is um, we have a tendency to think that it's particularly the information operations on social media that are most effective. That social media has allowed for a new form of mis, uh, di, uh, information ops that we didn't see before because of its scope and scale. And what they show is actually it's still the more televised information ops that are really doing the effect here. Um, and I think it's it's worth putting that in context. Um, they look specifically in Ukraine through a multi-set to to uh, uh, through a wide range of methods, including also uh, focus groups and interviews. And I think um, it, it, it does kind of allude to a potential bias that we may have, that the newness that exists of social media is also the ones that is most effective. Again, um, whilst we yeah shouldn't forget about how many people still today consume information, which is simply through... Um, yeah, new shows on TV um, and not on Twitter. Yeah. Um, okay, I do have two questions about uh, still, uh, you know, coming back to people part. <laughs> sure. uh, so one question is about, uh, you know, specific, you know, what skills are, you know, are the most required, right, uh, to set up the cyber force for a state? Uh, and the reason why, why, why I'm asking is, uh, you know, my understanding is that uh, USAID and, you know, different other programs, they actually supported Ukraine with educational programs uh, even before the war, right? And uh, their focus was actually on these operational uh, skills, right, operational cybersecurity. And, uh, you know, for me, like being a PhD, I was always puzzled, like, okay, why don't you support PhD programs, right, uh, in Ukraine? Why, you know, not to integrate Ukrainian science with Western science? uh in cybersecurity as well so do you think that part is important right like do we also need uh, kind of cybersecurity science uh, to be developed right in a state yeah it's a good question um also because right now what you see with a lot of countries are whilst their cyber command may have been established 10 years ago they're still figuring out what is the curriculum what's the training that we actually should give these people and it ranges enormously right so in some cases you will have a six week long program where a private sector company comes in provides a couple of modules lectures leaves 
and people can start to uh, some programs where it's a year long thing to other programs where many of your key people that are brought in are sent away for two weeks to a more international program and they come back and they get going. Um, and so the range is, is extensive and um, some of the ones that have developed longer programs, for instance, uh, and surprisingly the United States, they still massively struggle, right? And there has been a great brand study that basically said, you know, what we have been noticing is that it's hard to replicate certain skills because some of the best hackers acquired them not through formal training, but they acquired them through going to, you know, this hacker conference, meeting up with, you know, a couple of other people. They acquire these kind of tacit skills over time that cannot be easily formalized into, into a program. So that's, that's kind of one broader one. But I think what you alluded to, and I think it's a fair one, is the skill sets that you really require. And they, of course, differ significantly. Um, on the one hand, you've got your dedicated technical skills that can partially be acquired through um, taking courses also from private sector institutions um, that we see, whether this is, you know, your SANS course that also still some cyber command people will do to other um, certifications that still exist. Although there are limits often too, right? And, and it's worth pointing out because when you think about your military operation uh, or an intelligence operation for that matter too, that is conducted by the state versus much of the private sector um, attacking activity, they differ in their goals and setup, um, right? Where in the case of a private sector pen testing or red teaming company, ultimately they... Um, what, what matters is, okay, we've got this, um, we got this amount of time and then we need to build them and write a report. And so it's kind of like output matters here and, you know, we need to deliver. And so, uh, what happens, you're often using a ready set, you uh, set of frameworks of which it is easy to report on, write a report and kind of, you know, the, that, that aspect is the most important. Whereas for many of the intelligence and military organizations, the amount of time doesn't matter. It's the objective that ultimately matters. And also the way that you want to use your tooling can differ significantly as a result of that as well. You're going to use often slightly different tooling that is less detectable, might be harder to report on, but it doesn't matter for you. So we shouldn't do too much as if these skill set are exactly the same. The incentives, the way that they use it can differ as well, particularly between the more mature military organizations versus the private sector. And then, and I think what you alluded to is, yeah, I noticed it as well as there is still an opportunity for more educational programs, whether this is in Ukraine or in many other countries, to, to develop your broader skills group, whether this is your strategist that actually really um, need to better understand um, mm -hmm. some of the cyber operational activity that exists and you know, really need to think through also some of the conventional strategic concepts to your legal people that really need to be, um, that need to create still often dedicated programs need to be created and are lacking about making sure that your legal people that you have really understand cyber operational activity. So there is still a huge mm -hmm. gap today that um, exists on the training side across the different types of um, skill sets that are required for an effective cyber command. I see. Yeah, I was trying to, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, everything makes sense, right? So I was trying kind of to rephrase and, uh, uh, for example, like, you know, for a state to have a significant uh, cyber force, right? Do you need to have in-house, uh, you know, firewall solutions, in-house penetration testing tools that you, you know, some in the way, develop these innovations, right? Or it's still more about just operation, more about talents to do penetration testing, right, and so on. And, and no, you certainly you would certainly need that. And and of course, there is a difference between how some of the different countries are set up. It's kind of like your, uh, if you would have the, uh, you know, old economics equation, which is output is labor uh, times capital, right? Mm -hmm. Some are very much sort of on the capital side. You heavily invest in your tooling. You heavily invest in your infrastructure, which means that actually the 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 labor requirements reduce, and actually the talent to actually 
use some of that tooling can be reduced as well. Uh, others mm. will focus a bit more on the labor side, are a bit more lighter on the tooling. Um, and, you know, um, um, mm. yeah, it's, it's mostly, you know, what, like your operation, like uh, what, your, what your people are doing. It's kind of something that is loosely a point that has been made by the Grok as well on the distinction between China and, and the U.S. actually, where his argument is that in the U.S. you will see heavy investment in capital um, where you create all these fancy exploit frameworks internally, not taken from the private sector. So, uh, and then actually the operational skill set required is not always massive. You can basically have some some really good developers developing it, and then your developers can go on and just deploy those those capabilities, which is different from a Chinese perspective, was this uh, early argument where there was a much more labor focus and less capital intense focus mm -hmm. on their operational activity. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, second question I had about, uh, again, like this uh, people component, right? It's uh, during the war, right? Like, okay, we'll have lots of these specialists, right? And we already have uh, uh, who support different, you know, protect uh, Ukraine from cyber attacks, right? And uh, you're also doing some counteroffensive. Uh, so after our victory, right? Like, uh, uh, do you have any advice uh, how how they will fit in cyber landscape, I would say, right? After Ukraine's victory. Yeah, yeah that, that's not a terrific question here. I mean, inevitably you're going to lose some and it really will then depend on your mission, right? If then suddenly after the war and fingers crossed that will, will happen soon, um, after the war, there is no mission set anymore, right? The, uh, the, the military cyber force is not allowed to operate in peacetime. It's not allowed to do reconnaissance anymore in peacetime. And it's then all handed over to the intelligence. You will have an extreme brain drain. And then the best you can do is set up some type of reserve force of the people that were previously in there. But that comes with massive limitations as well, because this plug and play solution is not really effective. What do I mean with that is when you think about cyber operations, as I previously mentioned, it's about knowing the target network of your adversary better than they do themselves. Now, that often requires time. So then working, if these people would leave, you have a reserve force and you call them in case you need, well, they are not intimately, they don't have this intimate understanding of knowing which networks they, they, they are targeting, right? They have not been in those networks for the years before. They are kind of coming in at the supposed time that it is desired. That works a lot better for forensics. That works a lot better on the defensive side, but it's a lot harder on the offensive side. So it's kind of... I mean, you should try and retrain them to some kind of reserve force, mm -hmm. but it's a very, um, it's it's a very imperfect solution. The best thing you can do is really to rethink again the the, the peacetime mission that you're having. Where today we are seeing a real split across countries, where in some countries the military force then ha does have a uh, a peacetime mission as well, um, but most mm -hmm. of them don't. Thompson tells me Ukraine will maintain some of its missions even even after the war, um, unless unless yeah, Russia com completely collapses. And 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 then you know so if it, so ultimately then to go into more specifics, it would have to model itself more almost towards a a US cyber command or the UK NCF National Cyber Force, um, because those are uh, organizational entities that do have a peacetime mission that are in peacetime allowed to conduct effect operations. And Ukraine, from both a uh, more general perspective as well as well as its unique perspective, can clearly make that case that the com competition, even in peacetime, if that term is useful at all, mm -hmm. is in constant competition with um, with Russia. Um, there is we should assume that it will always persist, and as a result of it, it should uh, ensure that it can continuously engage and disrupt operational activity from Russia, rather than trying to say, when the war is over, um, peacetime, it, will, it, it would have to say, when the war is over, there will be continuous competitive struggle in cyberspace, for which these disruptive capabilities are inherently required. Uh, I think that's actually like, you know, we have a good question about it, right? Because uh, previously, we had uh, on our podcast, uh, authors from cyber persistence theory, uh, and, you know, it actually talks about uh, continuous cyber competition, right? 
So can we combine these two terms, right? There are no shortcuts, but still you have to <laughs> participate in this competition, right? Uh, or you would phrase it in some different way. Yeah. No, I think it's a it's a very fascinating uh, book that uh, the Richard Hogan, Michael Fischer, and Emily Goldman wrote, um, and um, it's it's interesting, right? So they started from a different perspective, right? They look at less at the organizational side and more on what is the strategic landscape, right? And the strategic landscape that they observe is one of constant contact. States have an opportunity to constantly engage in each other's networks. And we should assume that there are no very clear red lines here, but countries can actively go out and and use this space for their strategic advantage. And as a result of it, what the U.S. should do is to continuously engage um, as quote unquote in the vision globally, seamlessly and um, uh, globally, seamlessly and continuously um, uh, to to uh, to make sure that they have. Uh, superiority in cyberspace. I think that's a very, it's a great way to think about it um, because for from a US cyber command perspective, it shows that it's not potentially only strategically aligned with this space, but it also solves some of the earlier problems that I mentioned around developing a cyber force. Uh, you know, for many other countries, like it, because for them, it means that the cyber command does have a peacetime mission. Nakasone can go out and conduct effect operations in peacetime. And it can go out and testify in front of US Congress and say, hey, we had these and these and these and these successes. And hey, we have these and these and these and these things that we still need to do. That's very different, again, from most other countries. And so when I say kind of no shortcuts, it's not to say that no country can develop a cyber force. The point here is it requires a significant amount of resources and time and a de- careful consideration of your mission set. And clearly, one of the few countries that has done that is the United States. Um, now, that said, the mission or the way in which the United States operates, it does come, of course, with a set of risks as well. And we should be considerate of that. Now, one thing that most people have focused on is this question around escalation. Mm-hmm. It seems that, you know, that activity is not as escalatory as some initially considered it is. But there are other risks as well. And one that, I, that is close to my heart is the risk of operating in allied spaces and to conduct disruptive operation in allied spaces. And that is one that I think is still not well enough addressed by U.S. Cyber Command. So what does that mean? It could very well be that to continuously operate against your adversary, the adversary might set up a command and control infrastructure in, let's say, allied country Denmark or the Netherlands or Germany. Now, under this current mission set, the US cyber command might come in and you know wipe whatever material is off the server and do this with perhaps notifying that specific government, but not necessarily with their consent, right? And they want to do this quickly, because they do want to keep this operational speed going. Now, that is that then becomes a, a more diplomatically challenging set of activities where you can see that U.S. Cyber Command may have that operational freedom, but few other countries do. And in this case, very few operations are actually between just two countries. There is almost always a third country involved where you know your operational activity is routed through some other network where some command and control infrastructure is some, set somewhere else. So, you know, this is a space where it's not just, you know, between two countries and everything in between is sort of um, not ungoverned, like the seas. It's a space that is inherently populated by other people, country, and infrastructure on which often then the U.S. government is actively operating on. Um, I guess like a quick follow up here, right? W- w- what do you think about like this recent, uh, how, how would say like probably public statements, right? About moving towards offensive operations more. And that uh, I think US, uh, US, uh, US already did it, right? Previously, Australia, UK, Japan, uh, they really state that, you know, possibility of offensive operations. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting statement, right? And, and um, there's, there are a few things to unpack here because first, um, in some cases, I would still argue there is a lot of bark 
but little bite. The fact that countries will come out, create a cyber command, doesn't mean that they have an operational capacity. The fact that some countries will come out and say, we will, if needed, conduct effect operations, doesn't mean that they're able to do so. And people have sometimes confused these public statements, right? <laughs> and so, and it's the same with, let's say, NATO countries that have come out and said, in case desired, we will attend, we will uh, deliver sovereign cyber effects to the alliance. Well, you know, at least 12 countries have signed up. But it's not entirely clear that many of these countries are actually able to do so at a given point in time. But, and I think that's an important one. And, and it comes, so public statements and institutionalization in cyberspace is even more important than, um, than in the conventional space. And part of that comes from the signaling potential of cyber capabilities. You can famously not parade computer code on the streets of Moscow. It's harder to showcase what you have. Now, if that is the case, you are more willing to often signal through public statements, through creating, again, a fancy cyber command where someone can come and cut the ribbon, you know, because those are physical things or things that can be more easily showcased. Now, so, so that's, that's one, and I think it's often forgotten. That said, we do see a trend, and, and to some degree, a split. Today, we see two different types of countries, very clearly in the West. One type of country where, again, a cyber command only has a wartime mission. They can maybe do it then, but you know, if, like, then there's still huge potential of what they can do in wartime if they can't operate in peacetime. And then you've got another uh, set of countries that have clearly spelled out a much more active approach in cyberspace and have also ensured that the organizational structure and legal mandate is set up in such a way that they're able to do so. And the two that really jump out here are the UK, with the uh, NCF mm -hmm. and the U.S. Cyber Command. But this is not the way that um, almost any country in continental Europe are operating. And, and so that's what really, you have to kind of look a little bit more under the hood to see what matters and what doesn't matter. I think analogy with, uh, with the parade was interesting because, uh, and it may be even fitter for this than, than we may think, because even though you can't show code on a parade just similar with the actual physical uh you know vehicles right on the parade they have to look pretty they don't have to be able to shoot or you know uh with self fire that, that's yeah. true and I, I, by the way i think i stole the quote from thomas red but i have to go back to uh, to some of his uh, his early sources to see if that's if that's the case um it is the case though that um the USSR did parade specifically computers during some of its parades in the past. So um, I, I didn't know. Um, perhaps not computer code, but there were specific types of computers that they paraded to show, I guess, their technological advancement. But then, as you say, they have to look fancy. Who knows what the what the motherboard is that is inside of it? That's true. Um, Alex, do you want to go in uh, cyber arms? Uh... I think we have a lot here, right? And he wanted to ask actually several questions uh, about your recent work on cyber arms transfer. So what do you want uh, us to give you, Mike? I'm not sure if he'll be able yeah, to. Yeah, I'm, I'm just okay. concerned uh, about the background noise. <clears throat> yeah, the, what bothers me a lot in the discussions that uh, I participate in with my colleagues uh, right now in Ukraine, like almost daily, uh, is uh, misuse of certain concepts without uh, digging deep into what they really mean in cyberspace. Uh, and uh, your work uh, on better framework and uh, specifically on uh, the incentives of, for arm transfers between nation states uh, gives uh, perspective, but uh, I, I still feel alone, you know? So I would really, I would really like uh, my colleagues uh, and opponents sometimes to hear it from you just um, could you please just spend some time to uh, express what you uh, consider good analogies for um, for weapons the process of transfer other types of capabilities and their uh, modes of transfer and so on. So 
traditional traditional objects in real space do not have um, universal representations in cyberspace, right? So you cannot say that cyber weapon is the is the thing, right? So it, 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 it's a capability. Capability is uh, described in the best way by representing representing it uh, as a combination of again people, infrastructure, tools, organization, and so on. So uh, can we can we please spend some time on this topic, just linking um concepts in real space kinetic space and cyberspace and uh, just underlining the uh, key differences between these uh, concepts in these different environments yeah it's a great great question unless you say um you know the, using the term cyber weapons is a is a real challenge because you know what does it really allude to what aspect of an operational activity it's much better to think about operations for which sometimes certain uh, assets and infrastructure is used to um, achieve your goal that you may have. Um, so um, when I think about kind of capability transfer, uh, as you know, the capabilities that I've put in the Patio framework, I, I started with what is conventionally being transferred, right? Now, when we think about the conventional space, we, some transfers are more common than others. So the most common type of transfer are the transfers of um, ready-made goods. Um, so what would that, for instance, be? It would be, I don't know, AK-47s or you know, something which you, you give to someone else and they can use, particularly if those uh, transfers, those capabilities require um, limited uh, training. Um, why is that useful? Well, it actually helps the de defense industrial base at home who has been developing these capabilities. And also it creates this lock-in effect in a certain alliance, particularly as these technologies may get more, um, more advanced. Uh, you might get a technological lock-in there at, uh, at two where you can only operate within a certain alliance framework if you're starting to deploy these capabilities. So that's where the incentives lie. And then as we move kind of towards um, uh, other transfers, so for instance, the transfer to uh, allow you to de further develop these capabilities or to really create the capability for other countries or governments to innovate themselves, to create new capabilities altogether, that's the type of transfer you rarely see in the conventional space. Well, why? Is because you lose this lock-in effect long term. You don't want countries to basically create that independence, um, and yeah, you're creating a competitive market against yourself as well. And you really then need the trust, really, really deep trust of that allied government to go that far. So in the conventional space, this is what we see. You will transfer mostly um, uh, ready-made uh, capabilities. Now, for cyber, the, it seems to be slightly different. And first, that comes from when we think about capabilities, many of the capabilities in cyber are what I would call rivalrous goods. And what that entails is that the usage by one actor or the consumption in economics by one actor influences the consumption of another. So um, if, if think about it in this way, if... Uh, if um, Germany will give uh, leopard tanks to Ukraine. The usage of leopard tanks by Germany or by the Netherlands or whatever in Mali is not really influenced by it. They can still deploy them there. However, if Germany would give specific exploits to Ukraine, uh, specifically, you know, your old days, the usage of Ukraine against certain targets will influence similar usage of those exploits against other targets in the world, right? And so consumption by one influences consumption of another. And you see this particularly on the exploits and, on, and to some degree also on the tooling side. And so, and more broadly, the uses of tactics, techniques, and procedures by one actor, if you would transfer them to another actor, it will make it more harder to conduct these operations. And so if that is the case, actually for cyber, 
you know, you don't see the same incentives to do this type of transfer of ready-made capabilities. You're not going to do that as easily. So where you do see it, or where there are incentives, is potentially in allowing others to innovate or in others to train up their own capabilities. But that only happens in a more narrow set of cases, right? Because you need to trust that ally, which in this case would essentially mean you are going to help train up the cyber force, for instance, of another country. And so it could be, although we don't see it really today, it could be that the US will have its billion dollar cyber range and it will invite the Dutch to train on that billion dollar cyber range rather than their couple of million dollar cyber range, meaning that their ability to, to test, to train, and to understand operational dynamics massively increases. But you really need to be very close from an ally perspective to allow that to happen. And so what this has led to is, is my argument would be countries have to really start deploying more on the innovation side together. So for instance, on the cyber range side, that's where they can actually do more transfers. On the infrastructure side, that's where it's possible because you don't have that rivalrous goods problem that you will have with your exploits and your tooling. And, um, and, and so that, that's one, uh, or rely more on some of your key allies to do this. And then second, we, we see is, of course, the dynamic that I previously mentioned around NATO. It's for that same reason that we see a unique alliance dynamic within NATO. So normally in NATO, countries are offering their sovereign capabilities, their military capabilities to the alliance. NATO doesn't own capabilities. When the time arises, a country provides their you name what type of military equipment to the alliance to be deployed. In the case of cyber, as I mentioned, they, you don't offer your military or your military cyber capabilities. No, you offer your sovereign cyber effects, which means that you don't need to say how you achieve the effect. It could have been done through a whole set of fancy exploits, but it could also be done in another way. But that's not what you're sharing. So the way that they try to overcome the rivalrous goods problem is to say, you only have to sh share that you're able to achieve this goal, not how you're going to do this and with what kind of capability you're going to do this. And so that's the way that they are trying to get out of it. But that often, of course, leads to questions on what are countries able to do? How can you integrate that? How can you be for sure? Can this be assessed? All of those kind of questions. So the way to transfer capabilities, once you finally start to unpack it, so once you no longer just talk about can we transfer cyber weapons or not, but really talk about the specific elements, it starts to show that some type of transfers are way harder than others um, and, and that the dynamics of cyber are very different and conventional. And I would agree with you that it's, that it's not always well understood. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just <laughs> rephrase it in uh, in uh, the terms that uh, I would find <laughs> usable in, in discussions. So uh, you have put it uh, very politely as uh, slightly different, but uh, for me, frankly, it's uh, quite reverse. So countries are uh, much less interested in sharing uh, know-how in how to produce new armament technologies in the kinetic space, but uh, to the contrary, they are more um, interested in teaching allies how to do the same in cyberspace. So, for instance, um, the U.S. want the, the U.S. could share some high Mars, maybe even in large quantities. Maybe they would even place some. Um, factories on the territory of Ukraine in order for supply chain to be less fragile and vulnerable. vulnerable. But I am uh, doubting that uh, there would be a transfer of uh, intellectual property that would allow Ukraine to produce the next generation of uh, MLRS, right? And vice versa. Sharing, sharing the actual artifacts, sharing exploits and toolkits is um, I think it's prohibited by policy just to avoid uh, operational tracking and uh, clusterization. But uh, but 
to the contrary, sharing the know-how, how to produce that yourself and how to train personnel and build uh, organizations and processes is uh, much more preferable. Am I getting it right? That's correct. I mean, it, so if there are real opportunities to transfer, it would indeed be allowing Ukraine to develop its own capability. Yeah. And not the specific way of like, you know, here is an ODA to use. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it can, you know, in unique cases, you can see, of course, uh, I mean, there is there is one additional out layer here uh, that I didn't want to touch upon that, that further... Um, that further complicates things. And that's the attribution layer, right? It's very different if, let's say, the US, in a certain case, would share specific um, uh, tools or exploits that they are using themselves as well. Or if these are kind of things that they have, have never used and can benefit Ukraine. Why? Is because you want to avoid potential confusion. Right? Who is behind it? If I would really start sharing my tactics, techniques, and procedures, it muddies the waters around attribution as well. Now, it can be beneficial because suddenly your adversary doesn't know anymore who this attack is coming from, but it can also create an even more dangerous game as all of this operational activity starts to look alike. And so that creates disincentives as well. And so if you don't want to share at all, you would ideally want to share then things that are really outside of your own remit and what you would have, what you've ever used yourself before. That makes sense. Um, Alexi, uh, is there anything else we wanted to cover? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about like this discussion, right? That uh, many of cyber capabilities, right? They you know developed by private companies, right? By industry a lot, right? And whether this make any change to this, you know, cyber arms transfer, because usually probably private companies will, you know, less regulated with military uh, will participate in this sharing, right? Um, yes and no. And so why yes and why no? We see particularly the private sector being able to create an international network of clients in the intelligence, espionage spyware realm. Why is that? To some degree, going back to my point about rivalrousness, because they are less likely to be discovered, my usage of a certain spyware tool in country X is, not is by nature much less likely to be discovered in a highly disruptive operation. And as a result of it, I can reuse that capability again against another country, against another client. And so... In that sense, you know, by nature, because of it being more um, less likely to be detected, discovered, uh, being more stealthy, it's easier to play a game with multiple with multiple clients. On the effect space, um, you're right in that you know, but what we see primarily are actually. Um, the type of smaller outlets of people who have left a government entity and then will develop a shop with literally five people that essentially are selling to a really select group of people. And you see this in the exploit space, you see it in the tooling space. These are then, you know, essentially, yeah, you will find them, let's say, in Arlington in the US. You will find a few of them, you know, in the UK. But who do they supply to? There again, they don't have, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to supply to India or and certainly not to an adversary. They're going to supply then to a very select group of clients, many of, of which most of the employees were previously working at. So that's and that's mm -hmm. the most common tendency that you see. Um, and, and in fact, of course, some of the governments will use their, if it is not their legal power, will use their buying power to enforce that. You also see this with exploit brokers where it's very clear like, hey, listen, once you start selling to these countries as well, we will never purchase anything from you in case we find out. So they're using that purchasing power to also create that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we are already running out of time a little bit, but you know, if you have two minutes uh, you know, covering this topic about charms, 
Uh, I know in your new book, right, that you co-edited, right, uh, you also, I think, argue against cyber war term, right? So can you so, tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> um, actually, so, so the book, um, um, Disrupt, Deny, Deceive, it's a book that I co-edited, uh, uh, Whether Cyber Conflict is an Intelligence Contest, I co-edited with, with Bobby Chesney at the University of Texas Law School, and we invited really a wide set of contributors um, to this question mm-hmm. about, you know, if it is not cyber war, and what we mean with that, if we don't see these super high and disruptive, destructive activities, um, um, you know, in partic- uh, across the world, then what is it? Because it's mostly a competitive space that takes place below the threshold of armed attack, right? And we invited scholars and experts with a really diverse set of opinions to explore that question. And what is fascinating is for, for us too, as editors, we really just wanted to get the best people involved to give us their answer. And we were mm-hmm. kind of like, we're trying to be kind of referees, arbiters in the sense of like being as neutral as possible and giving people the platform to debate this. And the answer is sort of 50-50 in the book, and that's fantastic. Some will, Many will say it is an intelligence contest. What we see here is essentially military cyber commands taking on roles that the intelligence agencies previously did. And, you know, the cyber and, and these operations that we see are mostly types of sabotage, covert action. They rely on deception. They're focused on information advantage. All the things that we saw in previous intelligence periods as well. There is nothing new there. And then we got a group including, um, for instance, Michael Fischer-Keller and Richard Hognett, who contributed to the book, who showcased that, that you know, it's not an intelligence contest, it's something fundamentally new. And so the book tried to put this dialogue together. And in addition to this dialogue, it also then provides an incredible set of case studies of different people to write on um, how Russia operates, how uh, the UK operates with Karen Martin writing a chapter, a Chinese perspective from Jingwa Liu, a former colonel in the PLA. And then we have the private sector perspective or what the private sector is doing in this space as well. So it provides a holistic overview. Um, and the debate is relevant. And I want to mention this. It's not just an academic debate. Ah, is it an Intel contest or not? Because it fundamentally changes our perception on success and failure and what types of norms we should have in this space or not. Because if you believe... This isn't. Um, if if this if you believe this is more like war, then you do think about concepts like winning and losing much more zero sum. Whereas if you think it's an intelligence contest, in some ways both can win, as long as both are happy that this activity is not too escalatory, that they find out things about each other, that this is a space that is relatively stable. Perhaps winning is something very different. But the question of victory there doesn't really exist. It's a, it's a game that never ends. So, so uh, it, it matters you know, how you think about it conceptually. It matters how you think about winning, losing, success, failure. And it also matters about norms. Because if you think it's like age-old intelligence, we, we don't need to think about international law or you know, establishing new norms. Um, then you, if you may think that the completely new game is afoot, if you think it's something fundamentally new, then we also have to rethink what are red lines. We have to rethink about what are the right norms in this space and so on. Mm-hmm. So the book, we, we as editors do not take a specific stance. Instead, we really try to enable a emerging dialogue across some of the best people in this field. Uh, and, you know, for, for the case of this, uh, you know, uh, R- Russian-Ukraine war, uh, so th- w- would you consider this a cyber war? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I would consider it a war which sees cyber elements that, to an extent that we have never seen before. And of course, it's not to the same scale. But if you think about Georgia 2008, um, you know, the extent in which Russia has used um, cyber operations is, is really unprecedented. Now, some can debate on whether that then has strategic value or not. But just the number of wipers alone is just yeah. is just mind boggling. The num- like we have discovered more Russian wipers than almost we have discovered any number of wipers in the past of all actors combined. It's just yeah, it's just 
something that people don't often realize. And of course, these are smaller. Of course, the, these are not like the big wipers that you saw previously also deployed against Ukraine. Um, but so, so the operational tempo is significant. Um, we'll have to wait and see what's going to happen in the coming months. Um, but uh, it's, it's quite extensive. So cyber, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an element that deserves um, the attention of whether this is policymakers or academics or anything, anyone else, really. Thank you. Yeah, we, yeah, we definitely agree. And uh, there are also even debates about uh, uh, calling some cyber attacks uh, war crimes, right? Uh, that's uh... true. And, and there's been fascinating research from uh, and, and work being done there, including from Lindsay Freeman uh, from uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, uh, who I highly recommend also to put on this podcast, who's put the uh, case forward um, in The Hague and uh, um, has done a really interesting and good analysis documented particularly the activities of sandworm in ukraine uh, mm-hmm. to, to build up this case so we'll see how that's going to play out in uh, in the future mm-hmm. thank you awesome yeah um we just want to be mindful of your time we are uh, already past several but uh, max thank you so much for joining thanks for um unpacking you know uh all the intricate details of, of your work um, and uh, for the inf- uh, insightful conversation. And uh, usually the very last questions that we ask is uh, what would be your advice or message to Ukrainian audience? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, the coming week is going to be a critical one, it seems, from the public statements. So um, we will all kind of sit and watch and listen to see what's going to happen um fingers crossed i guess hang in there it will be critical but uh sadly uh we should not expect and no one is expecting that it will be decisive so we are to some degree whether we want it or not in for the long game and uh hopefully we can all stay motivated to um to in the end to ensure that this leads to the most positive outcome possible Thank you so much for your support. Thank and you. uh, we also uh, encourage all our listeners to help uh, Ukraine in any way, uh, in any way uh, suitable for you to, um, um, to in the struggle to, for democracy and for freedom and uh, in case of Ukraine for its very existence. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you so much. Um, uh, we hope, uh, uh, thanks for also referring uh, Lindsay to this podcast. We'll definitely talk to her um, and uh, definitely uh, hope to see new works and um, maybe another time on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.